and welcome to Stamper Cinema. I am your host. My name is Andrew. Thank you very much for downloading this latest episode. You guys are in for something really special. The guest I've got in store is a friend of mine that I met on the internet. You're going to love her. Her name is Brooke. You can find her on Twitter at Queen Double B. Now, she and I go back, I don't know, maybe, maybe about a year. We, we share an interest in horror films, 80s movies, 80s music, Madonna. She's awesome, but I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let her introduce herself. She's far more interesting than, than, than I am. So with that, let's get on with the show. Well, good evening. How are you? I'm wonderful. Wonderful. Got to um, get a refresher on Friday night last night. So. Awesome. <laughs> Doing pretty good. Yeah. Well, we're going to begin with a little icebreaker. Obviously, people that are listening to this podcast, this is their first introduction to you. So I like to ask five very, very important questions to, to get it all started. So you're on the hot seat. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Pizza or tacos? That's very hard, but I have to go with pizza. Pizza? Okay. What, what's uh, what's your go-to uh, pizza toppings? Cheese. cheese. Plain cheese. Plain yep. cheese. Okay. Awesome. Christmas or Halloween? If pressed, I'm going to go with Christmas. Christmas. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Terminator or aliens? Terminator. The, the hands down. Yeah. iPhone or Android? iPhone. iPhone. And lastly, coffee or alcohol? make people choose a name. <laughs> hey, well, you have to. I mean, that's why it's an iceberg. People people have to know, you know, what, what Brooke's all about. I guess coffee. Coffee? Coffee, yep. <laughs> big coffee, big coffee uh, connoisseur. Do you? Not really, but like, I don't, I don't have a day that starts without a cup. And it's yeah. only one cup. I'm not a crazy person about it, but I have mm. to have one cup. <laughs> sure, sure. Now, Brooke, what part of the country do you live? So I'm in the Raleigh, North Carolina area. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, yeah. 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 Awesome. How long have you lived there? Is that where you're from originally? No, I lived here for gosh, going on, I guess it's 15 years now. And before that, I lived in South Florida, just north of Miami for about 11 years. But I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. Okay. Um, like the Southwest suburbs of Chicago. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So a little bit, a little bit all over. I also lived in uh, South Florida for a time. I lived on the Gulf side. I went to high school in, um, shit, uh, Naples, Florida. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My sister lived over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for taking the time to chat. Um, so for the listeners, Brooke and I are, are, uh, our, our, our Twitter friends, if you will. And yep. mutuals. Mutuals. Yes. Yes. Mutuals. Just reaching out to some people that would be willing to talk about some. I mean, it is October, so we want to talk a little bit, some scary films. And Brooke has a doozy for us. So which which movie are we going to be talking about? We are talking about Fright Night. Like, how far back do you go with this movie? So I saw this movie when I was a kid. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, I was probably around seven. I want to guess that, like, my dad was watching it on HBO or something mm -hmm. in our family room. And I was like, can I watch this with you? And he said, okay, <laughs> because it was the 80s. Yeah. HBO, I think, introduced a generation of people to a world of movies when we were growing up. And Fright Night was obviously no exception. And I can't think of a time where I didn't know about Fright Night. It's just one of those movies that I saw at a really young age, probably too young than that I probably realistically should have. I know that I would have had like middle school parties and we would have shown this movie with like friends to introduce them. But I mean, it's always been a huge fan of, you know, of mine for a myriad of reasons, but I'm curious, like what about this movie has kind of like struck a chord with you? Um, you know, I think it's just, it's so well done because the story is so good. I mean, you have the same person who wrote it that directed it. It was just Tom Holland's vision. So I think, you know, he really put a lot into the characters and kind of gave them a backstory without even giving you too much. You just knew who these people were. And for whatever reason, it just worked really well. Like you, and there's themes in this movie that, you know, about growing up and about discovering, you know, your sexuality or whatever it is. Um, that's it really, I mean, I didn't realize that when I was a kid and I saw right. it, 
when I was a kid and I was like seven years old, I'm just watching it and I'm going, wow, like there's a reverse werewolf situation transformation going on here that's beyond anything I've ever seen before in my life. Like, it's just so terrifying. Um, and then, of course, you know, I was scared when the first time I saw it. And then over the years, it just becomes like this great story about these people um, learning who they are. I just think it's really cool. Is there a specific like character in the movie that you really kind of like latch onto? Is it is it Charlie's journey? Is it is it Amy? Is it Ed? Is it Jerry Dandridge? Like, I mean, obviously they're all really fun characters, but is there one that you've kind of like latched onto? I mean, Jerry's my favorite character because he's not just your regular vampire. Like he's, he does have human qualities he, they, and they try to make him, you can tell throughout the movie that they try to make him more human. You know, he eats fruit. He, um, doesn't kill Charlie. He has plenty of opportunities during the film to kill Charlie. And he doesn't because it's his humanity shining through. He sees that picture of the woman who looks like Amy that he used to go out with or whatever. And that also adds another human element. Okay. He's not just like this bad. He was human at one time, just, just like all vampires were. So He's my definitely my favorite character. And then I think Amy, she's it's interesting, like what she goes through during the film. Um, she, really, I mean, Charlie just kind of annoys me, to be honest <laughs> with you. Like, I think that's the point of Charlie is just to mm-hmm. be annoying. Um, and Evil Ed, he's interesting, too. I mean, he's funny. He's quirky. He's got his own issues going on with bullying. Um, they're all great, but yeah, Jerry's Jerry's my man. I love it. I love it. Now you did mention, uh, the, the director, writer, director, uh, Tom Holland. This was his first film. Now, obviously since then, since this film, he's, and granted, even prior to this, he had a lot of like experience. I mean, he was involved with class of 84, but oh, love that movie. Oh, it's great. Uh, early Michael J. Fox. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, what else? And then after this, he would do Child's Play. And um, Chris Sarandon was in that, too. So he worked with Chris Sarandon a couple times. And then he did a couple, like, Stephen King thing. Like, he did Thinner. And he did the the TV version of The Langoliers. I don't know if you ever yeah, saw Yeah, I watched that. Mm-hmm. Were you a fan of The Langoliers? It was okay. Yeah. Yeah. The special effects is the only thing that I really remember about that film and i would just remember them even in the mid 90s i guess it was early mid 90s i would just remember thinking it was a it, it was a, it was something but yeah like tom holland obviously um this was his his film debut and i think for me one of the things i love about this movie is this movie taps into something that that I love in other like similar films, like the whole idea of like voyeurism and like, for example, like this movie pairs really well for me when I think of this film and say the burbs or this film and say rear window where all of those films really kind of have that, that voyeur aspect. And I was just wondering if that was anything that, that I don't know that maybe like, um, that you can, I, I don't know if identify is the wrong word, but if it's something that, yeah. that like struck a chord with you at all. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I love, for whatever reason, I love movies like that. Rear Window is my down, like hands down favorite Hitchcock movie, mm-hmm. um, even over Psycho. Um, and, you know, I just, there's something about that, like watching from, the window and seeing what people are doing, seeing what they're up to, like just so intriguing. And that's really the whole, like in the beginning of the film, Charlie is watching him with a prostitute and he's, you know, brings the, the drink. <laughs> it's just, gosh, it's just such a good scene. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's something really appealing to that. And I don't know what it is. I'm sure there's something like deeply psychological going on there that mm-hmm. I like those kinds of movies, but yeah, it's interesting to me. Yeah, it was just such a like a trope that was so common for so long. And I mean, even still today, I think I mean, there have been modern films that really kind of like talk, you know, talk about your neighbors and, you know, spying on those that are around you. But that whole idea of 
just kind of seeing what your neighbors are up to. It's just something that's always kind of fascinating me, fascinated me. But what I wanted to kind of like share was one, I, one time I do remember in my like early twenties, my girlfriend and I were like once like the victim of like a, like a peeping Tom, like somebody like looking into like a window. It was like a really, really creepy event. And I don't know if you've ever experienced anything like that, but I, I go back to this, like the story where my then girlfriend and I were just hanging, she had like a big, big, huge backyard. And we were just out like hanging out with the, with my dog. And we all went inside. We went into a room to watch TV and a little while later, because my dog had been like barking in the, like the main house, trying to figure out what, you know, what, what had happened. We ended up going in the backyard and there were originally two chairs, but only one chair remained. Like one of the chairs was missing. And we're like, where's the chair? Like what, what happened to that chair? And so I went like around the side of the house, just trying to figure out like, well, where'd this chair go? Went and come to find out the chair was like propped right against like her bedroom window. And somebody had hopped on the chair and was just watching us like in like that bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. That is so weird. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever had anything like crazy yes. like that happen, but I think it was kind of like, you know, relatable to the, the, the film that we're kind of talking about as far as just people like being nosy and maybe sticking their nose where it really shouldn't belong. No, I mean, I haven't had anyone like that I know of spy on me where like, I'm one of those people where my, my ex-husband used to be like very concerned about, okay, the windows open, don't walk by naked. But like, I didn't (laughs) care. Like, I'm like, no one's looking in here. No one cares about us. Like Mm -hmm. that's only in the movies where people like look (laughs) in on like another movie I just thought of too is body double. One of my favorite Mm. De Palma films. Um, That's a great voyeurism flick. Um, But anyway, yeah, no, I'm, I was always like, no, I'm still like that. I'm like, I mean, they're not, no one cares. <laughs> and, if they, yeah. and if they do see, I don't care. I guess it doesn't really bother me, but that would freak me out if what happened to you happened. To, <laughs> that would change my whole perspective. Like I'd be closing the blinds every chance I got. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it was, it, it was disturbing. My, my then girlfriend was really weirded out. You just mentioned uh, body double. I just thought of another like voyeur film and we mentioned ago like an old like tom holland film like where he did class of 84 i don't know if you ever saw recently a couple of years ago summer of 84 oh the american horsery no yeah so this movie came out maybe like three years ago yeah it's a canadian independent film and it's essentially story of a few boys and they believe like one of their neighbors is a serial killer and again, just a kid getting his nose where it probably shouldn't. And the movie takes a really, really dark turn, very unpredictable. And um, yeah, if you're if you're if you're a fan of that type of genre, definitely check it check it out. I don't know if it's still on Shutter, but it was uh, streaming on Shutter for a little while. I don't know who has it right now, but so okay. good. It does have the kid from the Babysitter movies. But, um, oh, but yeah. I love those movies. Uh, went on a little side tangent there and everything. But I am curious. I mean, this is a movie that I don't I don't know if cult film is really the like the, the term I want to use for it. But it's a movie that has continued to find its audience. Right. You know, some 30 some odd years after it was relate, uh, released. And I'm just kind of curious. What do you think? What is it about? Is it just because it's well shot, well acted? What about this movie resonates I think there's something in the movie for everyone, literally, like, and I think that's what makes a film come alive. Because when I was younger, I've always loved this movie, but I would say like when I was in my 20s, which was 20 years ago, (laughs) um, I didn't think people like most people didn't know what Fright Night was. They would look at me like I had five heads when I mentioned this movie now because of media and like, you know, it had that comeback, it had that documentary made about it about six 
years ago and you know they they did a blu-ray but now i feel like it's just the go-to like everyone's like oh it's a cult classic well it's not really a cult classic anymore but um i think it's because again the story is just so good there's something in there for everyone there's romance there's you know um finding yourself there's it's like a coming of age story um there's the voyeurism stuff that appeals to a lot of people and the story itself is just original like who writes a story about a kid and a vampire moving in next door and him trying to you know reveal that he's a vampire it's just such a silly it seems like such a silly story but it's brought to life so well you've got Roddy mcdowell you've got really great talent in this movie like great actress even the, i don't know the mom's name forgive me but that actress is wonderful like mm -hmm. she has some of the best lines in the movie the music is a big part of why this film is great um it's got brad fidel doing the score who tom holland pretty much said after he saw terminator I have to get Brad Fidel to do this. And that theme song that like kind of plays over all the most integral parts of the movie is just, oh, it's just so seductive and it just draws you in. And then on top of that, the soundtrack that they didn't, they didn't have the money to pay like for these big songs that were big in the eighties. So they're like, we're going to have, we're going to have our own music made for this film. These bands are going to write these songs specifically for this movie and that's what happened and to this day i actually found some of the songs not all of them are on there but some of them are on spotify downloaded them i'm like jamming out to my <laughs> car to like he, he's a good man in a bad time because mm -hmm. the music to, to me i think music is a big part of making a film great and people i don't even think people realize how much it affects their love of or or dislike of a movie mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I love the music in the movie. I think it's it really does help bring it uh, to life. I, I love the kind of like the little eerie score that you've got going on it. And yeah, you've got some of these great. I don't know if they're necessarily like new wave, you know, bands or anything that um, and maybe a little bit, but just a fun, just a fun, just kick ass uh, score and uh, yeah, soundtrack. I love it. Now you mentioned this documentary. I haven't, I haven't seen it. What were some of those takeaways that you got from that documentary about this? So it came out about 2015. It was on Shutter, very short lived. It's I'm trying to find it recently, and it's not anywhere. It's not streaming anywhere. It's not even available on DVD. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to revisit it. But it was a documentary about the film. It was it had um pretty much I think all the core cast was interviewed for it. And then Tom Holland and the biggest takeaways I had was they talked about the music, how they couldn't afford to, you know, buy the, the music from a bigger artist. Um, they talked about it was a lot about how Tom Holland just came brought it to be like it was his baby. It was, you know, something that he wrote, directed <sighs> just a lot of stuff about the actors and like like Chris Randon had a lot of. Um, input on the character of Jerry like he was the one who kind of said he should be eating fruit um, he actually was the one too that said we should have like a picture of his ex-girlfriend and it looked like Amy like to make him more human mm -hmm. so he had a lot of input on that and um, that was from that movie as well they talked about the makeup the special effects they talked about Brad Fidel, the score. Honestly, I it's been it's been about six years, so I don't remember a ton of it, but um most of my knowledge about the behind the scenes stuff comes from that. Yeah, you, you just you, you said something regarding like Chris Saran that I just what I think what I, one of the things I love about about him in this film is and it's a line that you've heard many other people use, but he doesn't play the villain like a villain. You know, he he makes him extremely extremely empathetic you know you obviously he's still pure evil you know he's still killing yeah or you know and he, he's a vampire but he does do a great job of bringing you know a, a very like a real like human element to him and again just makes him kind of a empathetic character and you also mentioned he, he doesn't kill charlie i'm I, like i am curious like what do we think happened like had charlie just like, all right, my neighbor's a vampire. <laughs> hey, buddy, you know, I know you're a vampire. Like, are we cool? Can we just like, just pretend? 
that I don't know. And I don't know, maybe you, you don't kill my mom or me and you don't try to fuck my girlfriend. Like, is that okay? Can we, can we, can we just be like that? Everything cool? Like, what do you think? What do you think would have happened? Uh, there would have been no movie. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing about Charlie is, you know, as much as he annoys me, the character, he's, I know people like that in real life that just don't let things go. And that like, you know, whether it's political or whatever, they're like, I just got to keep talking about how horrible and evil this person is. And I'm never going to let it go. I know people like that. I've been very close to people like that. So that kind of person, it, no, they're not going to let it go. But yeah, if, if he would have just been like, hey, buddy, you know, <laughs> Or just acted like he didn't know, like he should have. Like, that's right. what I would have done. If that was me, I mean, like, I know this is going on, but I'm just going to be as quiet as I can. Because <laughs> as soon as as soon as Jerry knows, he wants to kill him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I just had a, had a moment just thinking about, like, the, the, the woulda, shoulda, coulda, and what would have been the the right approach if I would have, I don't know, just casually looked out my, my window and saw that my neighbor is a vampire, like how I would react. Like, would I want to hunt him down and kill him? Or would I just want to pretend like, no, mm -mm, none of my business. Well, it'd be one thing if he was a killer, you know, just a, a killer, you could go to the police and be like, look, he's bringing body bags out of this, you know, like <laughs> out of his house at midnight. Right. But he's not just a killer. You realize that he actually is a vampire at some point. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, you don't want to tell people <laughs> because yeah. like they're going to think that you're crazy. So you got to take it into your own hands, which is what Charlie does. Yeah. And then bring in television vampire killer, Ronnie McDowell, you know, Peter Vincent. Like there's so many great performances in this movie. I mean, obviously, Amy, Amanda Beers is great. William Ragsdale, who... Yeah, he's a little annoying, but I, I love his character. You mentioned the mom. I don't have her name in front of me, but she was fantastic. I, I mean, she she played it very, very light and was just such a like a fun, fun mom. But in my, as you know, again, um, Chris Sarandon crushed it. But for my for my money, this movie is like the Roddy McDowell show. And I love mm -hmm. him, love him, love him in this movie. Yeah, I mean, that look that he gives... Uh, that just like look of terror when he's watching um, Evil Ed disintegrate mm. in front of mm. him. And he just like, uh, you can't act better than that. I mean, his eyes, his body, his posture, just everything about it. He's, he's amazing. Yeah. He, and he steals every scene he's in. I mean, even one of my favorite movies, Overboard, my favorite scene in the whole movie is not even a Goldie Hawn scene. It's his little, you know, snippet at the end when mm -hmm. he's like, we're, most of us are only seeing life through one vision and you got to see it through it. Like, cause he's so affected in the way he says things. And it's like, I want to be a person who like says these, like drops these big, like yeah. <laughs> life changing lines. <laughs> He makes you want to be a better person. Yeah, he has a really great line, even in this film, which I'll, I'll get to in just a moment. But just because you brought up Overboard and I, oh my God, uh, just so good. One of my all-time favorites. I completely Me forgot. Too. And I've seen the movie a hundred times. You know, obviously I turn it on, they're like, oh yeah, Roddy McDowell. But I forgot that he's Andrew, right? That's his, uh, he plays mm -hmm. Andrew. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So good. But... What was I going to say? Oh, so we talk about this movie that comes out in 1985, roughly, roughly about a $10 million budget, as far as I recall, grossed about $25 million in the box office. So very, very modest success. I think for the year of like 85, it finished like, like 30, 32, 33, like in the overall box office, somewhere sandwiched between summer rental and um, the last dragon, right? Obviously, the big heavy hitter in 1985 was Back to the Future. But so a little while ago, we were mentioning like cult, cult status. Again, I, I just it's, it's just not a term that I really want to throw in for it, especially when this movie was very well received. I mean, at the time yeah. when this movie came out, 
Roger Ebert gave it three stars. I think it has like a 92 on Rotten yep. Tomatoes, but I don't know if you've had, ever had the opportunity to see or like read the, the review that Roger Ebert gave. It, I mean, it was positive. It, it's not what I don't think one of his greatest articles, but he does say something interesting. I just want to kind of, uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read like this little paragraph right here. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I love Roger Ebert. Yeah, it's a very short review. Yeah. So this is just in just reference to Roddy McDowell, who we just mentioned. The best line in Fright Night belongs to Roddy McDowell, who plays a broken down old hand bone actor who used to star in vampire films. The kids today, he he complains, don't have the patience for vampires. They want to see some mad slasher running around and chopping off heads. He's right. Vampires are doomed to live forever, have outlived their fashion. They've been replaced by guys in ski masks who hack their way through dead teenager movies. Fright Night is an attempt to correct that situation. And then it goes on, yada, yada. But so I, I do love that Roddy McDowell line, which the kids today don't have the patience for vampires. They want to see some mad slasher running around chopping off heads. And for a time, that was very, very true when it came to like 80s cinema, right? I mean, that was like the... You had all those like Friday the 13th films and several other Halloween films and Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, so like the whole like big slasher phenomenon was huge in the 80s. And for a time, vampire films became very passe. Now, as yes. times have come back, we've had some vampires, uh, vampire films, some really good ones. But I've been trying to think and I'm, I'm pretty like hard pressed to think if if uh, vampires are really back. So in regards to that Ebert quote, what do you think? Do you think it's still relevant? Like, do we have vampires kind of like outlived their welcome or do we just think it's just their day, their, their day will come back. There will be, because obviously HBO had that huge true blood show, right? I mean, that was a, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a big vampire show. And so I'm just kind of curious, like, have we moved on from vampires or is it just cyclical? Things come, uh, things come in and out of fashion. It, it's cyclical. And right now, I feel like there's a place for everything. Um, I do feel like, you know, right now there's a lot of, or in the newer age, there's a lot of those haunted house movies, which I'm not a huge fan of. I'm not really a, a fan of possession or haunted house movies for the most part. Um, I mean, I'll watch them. I love horror, but there was, I mean, the eighties, yes, that, that was the fad. It was, I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street two came out in the same year as Fright Night. Things do happen. I think there's a place for everything right now, honestly. I think if, if there was a great vampire movie that came out tomorrow, I think people would go see it. Um, people just want to see anything at this point that's going to distract them from from their everyday lives. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think it's cyclical. I think just like with quote unquote, I don't like this word, but hair bands, um, I call it 80s rock music, but that was all, I mean, that was all the rage at this time too. And while that has obviously gone away in you know, alternative rock or grunge kick that out of the water. It's, I mean, people listen to it now. It's like a fad to listen to it again. So things come in and out. People gain a new appreciation for things after they're gone. So I think it's, it, if there is a time where vampires come back, which I'm sure there will be, it's going to be kicked into gear by either a great film or a great TV show, just like it was, what, 10 years ago with True Blood. I totally agree. Do you, is this your favorite vampire film or do you have another vampire film that, that ranks? Um, this is my favorite vampire film by far. I, I, I like vampire films. I, I don't, there's not a ton that I love. I do love Near Dark. I mm. just saw that recently back in July for the first time I had not seen it before mm. a friend of mine was like let's watch this movie you're gonna love it and I was like eh. but I loved it it was it was great yeah um and I wasn't ever a huge fan of Lost Boys I'm not saying I don't like the movie I just yeah like I, I need to watch it again because it's been way too long since I've watched it hashtag deal breaker um but you know I do remember it. I remember watching that one when I was a kid. Um, what are some other vampire movies that are great that you can think of? Well, I mean, you just shat on the Lost Boys. No, um, let's see. No, no, I'm just saying, it, you know. Yeah, no, they're, I mean, you literally nailed a few of like my favorites. Big fan of Near Dark, huge fan of the Lost Boys. There's this. 
Um, when I think of like horror, like genres, vampire films aren't necessarily like my favorite, but I do enjoy a good, good vampire film. Right. I didn't really, I wasn't a big fan of John Carpenter's vampires. I didn't really think that was really fantastic. I enjoy interview with the vampire to a fault. You know, I, I love the, the artistic aspect of it. Uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. I, again, I love the, the artistry of it. I think, I think it, it looks fantastic. I don't know if I can consider it like a, a great movie. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I love Dracula. I love Bram Stoker's Dracula, but my favorite scene is the werewolf scene. I just yes. love anything with werewolves. <laughs> yes. Without a doubt. Yes. I think why, when I, when I think of Bram Stoker's Dracula, I go back to seeing it in the movie theater at like 13 years old. And I was with my mom. And there's a lot of nudity in that, in that film. And mm-hmm. so I think part of me is, is uh, scarred for life because I, I, I saw that movie with my mom and uh, yeah. So, but I did wa- actually, I did watch it last year. And again, I just, I, I, I Gary Oldman is just terrifying in the film. And I forgot that Monica mm-hmm. Bellucci was one of like the, Dracula's like ladies in there. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm just going a little side tangent. I can't think of any other vampire films off the top of my head other than your your classic Dracula films and everything. Mm-hmm. And, but I know there's one that I'm totally a huge fan of that I'm missing right now. It'll probably come to me as soon as we're we're, we're done. But whatever. Do you have like a favorite? genre of like horror films like what is your what is your your niche um i like body horror a lot what do you mean by that um, body horror like um well where i count werewolf films as body horror i love okay. werewolf films obviously american werewolf is one of the best films ever um yeah. and then also like i don't know if you ever saw society oh yeah uh, so that's a body horror film. Um, anything where they're like their body is. I, I consider Hellraiser a body horror film too because there's all that stuff which I like love. Hellraiser. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's just like a lot of like it's gory, yeah. but it's just terrifying for whatever reason. I just like it. I don't know. I'm a weirdo. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm. I'm, I'm it's uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. No. I thank you. I appreciate that. Now I know we're we're running out of some time, so. If you're ready, I'm going to I'm gonna give you a little pop quiz and test your knowledge on this film that I know that yeah. you know so well. You've already kind of indirectly answered a couple of these questions. So, okay, actually, I'll I guess try. before we do that, is there anything else that you feel that maybe we're missing that we haven't discussed? Mm, I think we have to talk about the nightclub scene. And I think we have to talk about the theme. You know, we talked about the themes of voyeurism in the movie, like and kind of like the sexuality and like them coming to realize you know, I think, you know, there's undertones of evil Ed maybe being homosexual. There's mm. the the assumption that Jerry and Billy, I think his name is, are a homosexual couple mm. when they mm-hmm. first move into the neighborhood. <clears throat> so yeah, there's, there's even the line by the mother. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's that kind of theme is going on within the movie. And I think like that nightclub scene when Amy is pretty much hypnotized, like Mm -hmm. she knows that Jerry's a killer. She knows that he's a vampire. And then all of a sudden she just loses all her self-control and looks into his eyes and he hypnotizes her. And it's sort of like she's her sexuality is being awakened. Like in the beginning of the film, uh, Charlie's trying to talk her into having sex they've been together for like a year and she doesn't really want to but she decides she's going to she's finally going to do it and then he's not interested it's more interested in what's going on next door and it sort of feels like they're like best friends who grew up together that that are going to have sex like they just it just seems very you know white bread but then you know she really discovers what desire is when she gets hypnotized by jerry and you see, I mean, you can feel that chemistry between them and then they start dancing and all of a sudden her hair gets big and her right. makeup's like really good. That's funny. That's always been very funny to me, but mm-hmm. it's like she 
figures out by that happening to her. And and one could argue that it's a little creepy because <laughs> he's like this grown man and she's you know, minor. I'm, I was thinking about that the last time I watched it. I was like, this is a little creepy. But at the same time, you're you realize that she's now figured out there's another part to sexuality, to her sexuality. It's just interesting to me. Um, so there's that. And then there's the evil ed stuff with him giving in and saying, you know, I don't want to be bullied anymore. So he goes with Jerry. And that's interesting to me, too. Yeah, no, I, I think both points are fantastic. Like, and I was watching it last night and that opening scene, right? Because of the fact that he's basically begging her to give it up, right? And she finally gives in and then he's staring out the window wondering what's going on, right? And so she's instantly rejected, right? Like her own sexuality is like, all right, I'm, I'm going to open up. And then when she does, she's not good enough, Right. She, yeah. She's not nearly as interesting as what's going on with this other woman, you know, in right. someone else's window. And yeah, that 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 nightclub scene when yeah her her uh, her sexuality is definitely uh, revealed. And as as you just very very eloquently stated, just with the new hair and new makeup. And uh, <laughs> but I mean, you know. Jerry Jander, Jerry, uh, Jerry Dandridge is wearing that, that, that kick-ass like sweater vest or that sweater <laughs> shirt that he's, that he's rocking. Right. So, yep. I mean, I think, I think I myself got a little, got a little, uh, heated over that. I mean, Chris Sarandon, he was, uh, he was rocking man. And he, he owned, owned that, that scene, right. Just that you, know, you got that great, like tracking shot when he comes into frame and, just you, just the way that it's editing, just seeing her reaction to him and him just staring at her, and yeah, and then her and then dancing, and there's a mirror in the nightclub, and she's mm -hmm. not seeing his reflection; she only sees herself dancing by herself. Just so cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and homosexuality is definitely another theme that that on one hand, you'd be like, well, you know, it's kind of, it, it was the eighties and they, they didn't want to like spell it out, but in a couple of scenes, they literally quite frankly spell out like there's, you know, uh, he has a live in, you know, and he's probably gay. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, and then obviously Ed probably is, is gay. Right. I mean, so there, there's definitely that element and I don't want to, I don't know if that was really necessarily what the movie was trying to kind of like tackle that element in or trying to make some type of social commentary within the eighties or not. I don't think it was necessarily what they were doing, but no. there is that, that element that you do see in a lot of, a lot of vampire films that, that whole idea of just a, a gray area when it comes to sexuality, that, that, uh, that vampires don't care, you know, they're, they'll, they're, they're down they're they're, they're, they're DTF, right? I mean, they're, they're down for fun. Um, but yep. yeah, they just want so, the blood. <laughs> they just want the blood. They don't care. Exactly. So, all right. I, I love that. Was there anything, was there anything else that you had in mind? No, I think we got it covered. I do too. I mean, this, again, this is a movie that I don't, how many times have you seen this film? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's probably around 50 at least. Yeah. yeah. I'm probably right there around there with you. Um, so, okay. This is gonna be a pretty easy, like layup pop quiz. So don't, don't be, uh, don't be discouraged or worried. I think you're going to do great. Let me find it. Okay. Here we go. Question number one, other than people, what does Jerry Dandridge spend a lot of time eating? Apples. <laughs> Apples. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Big, big fruit guy. I think I read something and you probably have read it too, where there's like little hints of him basically being a fruit bat. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that is correct. Question number two, name one of the two songs featured in that, that famous dance club scene. Give it up is the other one. Mm -hmm. I love that by Evelyn King. I want to say. Yeah. Evelyn King. Is it the best of uh, the best line in that song is I don't need a book to show me how I don't need an English teacher to help me <laughs> say I want you now. <laughs> so good. So good. So good. All right. Uh, question number three, Stephen Jeffries, evil. 
Uh, he is in a film with another handsome slash creepy actor by the name of Christopher Walken, um, featuring a song by your favorite artist. What was that film that he was in with Christopher Walken? Was he in At Close Range? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was in At Close Range. I guess he was. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen that, but yeah. 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 He is in that movie. Gosh, I didn't. I didn't realize I, for whatever reason, I didn't put that together. Yeah. Great film. Yep. And for the listeners, uh, the, the, the artist I'm referring to is Madonna. And what was the song that you did? It was uh, live, live to, to tell. tell. Right? That's live my tell. favorite song of all time. Yeah. It's uh it's, it's awesome. Yeah. All right. This is an easy, easy question, but has to be asked. This is for our listeners more than for, for the, more than you, but Peter Vincent is obviously named after which two famous horror icons. Um, he's, I know who it is. Um, <laughs> uh, Peter Cushing yep. and, and Vincent Price. Yes. And Vincent Price. And I heard that he was actually so, like, they wanted him to be in the film. I heard Vincent that too. Price. I, I heard that, but I couldn't, I couldn't find anything definitive on that. But I mean, that's just something that I, I didn't, I didn't get anything to confirm it, but I've heard that as well I, I just don't know but it'd be great yeah so yeah peter cushing and vincent price make up peter vincent it would have been great if they could have i don't know it could have been like peter vincent lee to have like christopher lee just to, so they they tackle all the all the draculas out there yeah uh what was that was that number three or was that number four i can't remember uh was that was that was number four number five all right so this this is not an easy question but this is just kind of putting us back in 1985 when we would have been like six, seven years old. The number one song on Billboard's top 100 at the time of this movie's release. Do you have any idea what song that was? I'll give you a hint. It was by the band Tears for Fears. Was it Shout? It was Shout. Shout was okay. the number one song in America when this movie came out. It was number one for two weeks. And it was replaced by a, a theme song from the movie Back to the Future. Any idea what that song would be? Uh, the theme song would have been Power of Love by Hugh Lewis and the News. Boom. Nailed mm -hmm. it. You crushed that trivia. <laughs> well done, Brooke. So that, I believe, let me just double check here. I believe that's really all I had for you. Again, I did want to just say thank you very much for, for taking the time. Uh, to hang out with me and talk about this movie that we both really, really love. So I really do appreciate it. Any, any closing thoughts, anything that you want to get off your chest before we, we wrap up for the evening? No, just that if anyone out there has not seen this movie, they need to see it. <laughs> ASAP. And the remake, while it wasn't terrible, mm. doesn't even compare. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that that's right. I'd be uh, kill myself if we wrapped up without mentioning the the 2011 film that had who was it? Anton uh, Anton Yelchin. He was in it. Mm -hmm. uh, Colin, which Colin was that? It was um, Farrell. Colin Farrell was in it yeah. as well. Was anybody else a note in that film? I, I there was um, an actor. He's been in some horror movies. He actually died, I think, in 2016. I want to say, I don't remember his name, but he was, he's a good actor and he's been in a lot of horror movies. Um, and, you know, unfortunately he, he passed away a few years ago. Which role did he play? I think he was the friend of Charlie. I think mm. he might've been evil, maybe. Yeah. Because obviously Anton Yelchin, you know, he passed away a few years as well, um, which was um, real, real sad uh, death that he I don't know Maybe that's heard. who I'm thinking of. Okay, okay so yeah. who's the guy from Superbad? What's his name? Uh, oh, are you talking about um, McLovin? Was McLovin in this? Yeah, he, isn't he Charlie? Or am oh, I losing my mind? I think you've got it backward. I think Anton Yelchin was <clears throat> Charlie, and I think... I think It's been so long since I've yeah, seen that. I, I, I saw it in the movie theater when it came out just because I was curious, but I haven't seen it since. Um, yeah, I saw it like right after it came out. Um, right, right, 2011. So Anton Yelton, yeah, he's the one that, that passed away. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he is Charlie. Okay. 
Okay, and yeah, Chris, and Christopher Mintz Plass uh, was was Ed, um, and Chris Sarandon. I forgot that he uh, he had an appearance in in that as well. And then Tony Collette, mm -hmm. huge cast, and David Tennant played Peter Vincent. Yeah, so pretty massive cast. Um, but yeah, not great. Not I mean, not terrible, but it doesn't hold up to the to the original. Oh, I can't even. Believe, I was going to say like even like the special effects albeit a little bit dated were fantastic and mm -hmm. fun little fact the guy that did the special effects for this movie also was like part of the guys that did like the special effects for ghostbusters um which i think is just kind of kind of fun ghostbusters being like one of my like all-time like favorite films but yeah so the special effects oh they're that, they're fantastic yeah. i mean that 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 scene with um evil ed transforming back to human mm. That's some that's some good stuff right there. It's underrated special effects there. People don't talk about that enough, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Brooke. I do appreciate it. Thank you. You're awesome. And uh I'll, I'll see you on the internet. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.